I'm travelling across the States on a baking adventure of a lifetime, indulging my passion for cakes. This is really, really good, I have to say. I'm about to meet some of the greatest bakers America has to offer. Good enough for the queen. It is. <laughs> queen of the cake. This is baking in the fast lane. Today, I'm in New England, visiting the culinary hotspots of Connecticut. First up is a visit to a food magazine for a guided tour and a cooking demo. Biscuits and scones are very similar right. in America. If you came to England, it would confuse you I think bits, I'd be lost. I'm okay. lost already. Then I'm discovering some true American hospitality at an old school diner. This place just goes on and on and on. And in my kitchen, I'll be creating some simple and delicious recipes for you to try at home. Mixed berry shortbread and bacon waffles. In Brian's diner, this is a small portion. It's really only when you drive around Connecticut where you understand why it's called New England, because the scenery is actually like England. Connecticut is said to be the birthplace for both the hamburger and the lollipop. Today, it's a hub for foodie activity. When I first was given the idea of travelling around America, talking about baking, I thought, is there going to be enough to talk about? But it's only until you're actually here where you really get to understand baking is such an integral part of day-to-day -day family life, wherever you go in America. Today, I'm visiting the busy test kitchens of an American home baking magazine. It's hopefully going to teach me a thing or two about one of America's most famous cakes, a strawberry shortcake. Because not only do they produce masses of strawberries in this country, and obviously they like their cake, so it's only natural that they would put two and two together. One of the magazine's most successful issues recently featured strawberry shortcake on its front cover. So what better place to be to learn how to bake it? Denise. I'm getting a guided tour from senior editor and home baking guru, Denise. Sweet ride, though. <laughs> you like it? I love it. I love it. So I'm intrigued to know what happens in here. We shoot the magazine, we shoot photos for the web, videos, we do it all. And do you make strawberry shortcake? Of course we do. Sounds good to me. So this is a hive of activity in here. I know, there's a lot going on today. So we tell are... me about the magazine then. So Fine Cooking is all about recipes for home cooks. Right. We want to make sure that you are a more confident cook at home and we give you all the recipes and all the techniques you need to do that. But this is the bit that people don't see because, you know, you actually yep. fully test the recipes, very similar to the magazines in the UK. You exactly. properly test them. Many, many times. Nothing yeah. gets made once. We make things six, seven times until it's perfect and then we shoot it. This is a, a photo shoot going on right now. They're making the food for a future story. Right, so what are, what are, we, what are we photographing here then? So they're doing a story on hollandaise sauce, actually, right. for their holiday issue, and they are working on the Eggs Benedict opening shot. Now, what's the most popular front cover then? Cookies. Cookies? Cookies are huge. If we put cookies on the cover, it sells like crazy. Well, it's cakes I'm after today, so it's time to get baking. This is where we shoot all the videos for the website. Right. Um, and today we're going to make some strawberry shortcake. It's a classic American dessert. The first recipe for strawberry shortcake was printed in a Boston cookbook in 1835. Right. It became really popular in the 19th century because the Transcontinental Railroad was created, and so they could ship strawberries from coast to coast. Whereas, you know, before that, they obviously strawberries are perishable. Yeah. And it's very simple, and that's, you know, kind of a classic American thing, a simple, delicious dessert based on seasonal fruit. Traditionally, they were made with shortening. That was the fat in there, so there's the short. And then, because there was shortening cut into the flour in such a way, it was a very tender cake-type texture as opposed to a bready texture, which would be the opposite of cakey. So, short cake. The first ingredients are flour, sugar, bicarbonate of soda, salt, and baking powder. So, you sift so that things are not lumpy. Yeah. And then, the other key to biscuits so they rise up nice and fluffy is cold ingredients, right? So, cold butter, would right. you mind getting out of the in fridge? The fridge right. We've got cold butter, we've yep. got 
cream and buttermilk in that measuring cup, and we've got one egg. And that's where this recipe actually is a little unusual. Yeah. The fact that there is um, heavy cream and buttermilk in it, and then also an egg, makes it really rich and right. kind of delicious. A lot of biscuits don't have eggs in them. So. You keep calling this a biscuit. Looking at the recipe that you've got here, we, yeah. we would call this a scone. A scone. OK, biscuits and scones are very similar right. in America. Very similar. If you came to England, it would confuse you I to I think bits. I'd be lost. I'm right? lost already. I'm not going to even mention shortbread. Don't even go there. That's a cookie. That's a biscuit. <laughs> what are you talking bread. about? <laughs> I don't know. Denise mixes the wet ingredients into the dry. So yeah. what is it about? Americans and bacon then. Why, why is it so popular? It's just, I think it's one of those things we love to do. It's a way to show people that you love them, I think, because you make some, but somebody something with your hands and and it's sweet and we all have sweet tooths. Yeah. And I suppose for kids then bacon is, is right. the ideal thing. I've said it all along because it excites all the senses, doesn't it really? It does. It does and it's a good way to do something together as a family. It's a wonderful activity. Denise rolls out the finished dough, cuts out the circles and places them on a baking tray. They get brushed with cream, sprinkled with sugar, before going into the oven. The cooked shortcakes look delicious. So to garnish this, we've got some cream. Yeah, we've got some whipped cream and a little bit of sugar. Yeah. And then we've got the beautiful berries. We actually mashed some of them with a potato masher right. to kind of release some of the juices. And then we sliced the rest, yeah. and it's like a sauce for the shortcakes. Now, this is the key to this, isn't it? The, that is. The strawberries and the shortcake go well together. Yes. Like a perfect match. Made in heaven. All you do to assemble is slice the shortcake in half, layer it up with strawberries and cream. And there you have it. That is a strawberry shortcake. You want to try it? I want to try in this. You just know that it's going to be good, though, don't you? That's the thing. Messy, but good. Well, it's home bacon, isn't it? That's exactly. A yummy, homey, simple dessert. The most important thing is that it tastes good. Mm, cool. <laughs> yeah, this I... is one of my favorite desserts. It is delicious. It's good. It's fascinating to see behind the scenes of a foodie magazine and see just how much work goes in to producing the food that you see photographed in those pages. But this one, I'm going to do my grandmother's old classic recipe of a mixed fruit shortbread. Now, the secret of shortbread isn't the recipe, it's these. You make it by hand. It's really important. So what you need, first of all, is some flour, sugar, and corn flour. Now, it's one of the few recipes where you would actually put corn flour into a mixture like this, but it produces this really short mixture, which is particular for these biscuits, because you want them nice and light. Also, cold butter. Rub the butter into the dry ingredients. Using the very tips of your fingers helps to keep the mixture cool. See, this mixture now is starting to get to a crumb. We need to bring this together, and we just add a touch of egg to this, and it'll start to come together. Now, the secret of any biscuit like this, particularly a shortbread biscuit, is not to work it too hard. And this needs to rest in the fridge for about 20 minutes. And this is what you end up with. Roll out the rested dough into a large rectangle. This is my old granny's rolling pin, the one that she used to use. It's been in our family 60 odd years. And then when you get to this stage, grab a cutter, depending on which size you want the biscuits. This is about a two and a half inch cutter. Carefully place the shortbread circles onto a baking sheet. Now, it's really important for this, once you've got the biscuits done, is to leave them to rest, ideally in a fridge, for at least 10 minutes before you bake them. They need baking at 360 degrees Fahrenheit, that's about 170, 180 degrees centigrade, gas mark four, for about 10 minutes. The cooked biscuits should be very pale in colour. So we can allow them to cool for a little bit. Meanwhile, we're going to make our sauce and our filling for this. The filling of it's quite simple. It's whipped cream. You could use this on its own, but I'm going to add a little bit of creme patissiere. And then I need a sauce to go with this. I'm going to make it out of berries. I'm going to use strawberries and raspberries. 
Split the berries in a food processor and then pass them through a sieve to remove any pips, leaving you a nice, smooth sauce. And now to assemble. Pipe some of the filling onto two biscuits, then place raspberries around the edge. I think Denise will be impressed with this in terms of the way that it looks in the end. It's very different to the one that she did in terms of presentation, but the flavours are almost the same. You've got soft fruit, the cream, and the shortbread or cake or biscuit, whatever you want to call it. But what I'm going to do is just to glaze the top. To do that, just take some icing sugar. And it's just a good way of colouring the biscuit. Now, you can either do this under the grill or with a blowtorch, but the idea is you want to, like, brulee the top of it. Spoon some sauce onto the plate, stack the layers on top of each other and garnish with fruit. And there you have it, my mixed fruit shortbread. It really is a classic combination, however you wish to present it. That tastes lovely. I'm driving through Connecticut, experiencing the best food the state has to offer. Next up is something that I've been really looking forward to, a slice of real Americana, an old-school diner. A lot of these diners were actually made off-site, a bit like a, a large caravan, and people would just buy a restaurant, pick a spot, and just dump it there. So you could call it the first pop-up restaurant before pop-up restaurants became really trendy. So I'm here in Middletown, and the diner which I'm going to go see is a proper original American diner that serves proper, I mean proper, authentic food. O'Rourke's Diner has been the staple in this community for decades and I'm meeting the current owner, Brian O'Rourke, to find out more. This is the real thing. So when did this start for you, then? For me? Uh, yeah. 1958. Was it your uncle that owned this? It was my place? uncle who founded it in 41. Right. Um, and it's, it's a landmark. It's uh, synonymous with the word diner, and it, yeah. uh, it's, it's the American Diner Plus. They tell me we've taken it to different levels. Yeah. Now, this is how I think of a, a proper American diner. There can't be many of these original ones left. Um, it's one of a hundred, maybe, that's surviving and thriving. I came here in 1946. I was on a tractor trailer across the street, and it came over here, and it got set on a foundation. That's how it happened. This diner is the real deal, but it hasn't always been plain sailing. Well, what a great place. This is a proper diner. O'Rourke's has had to overcome plenty of challenges over the years, including a terrible fire that devastated it back in 2006. Um, something got left on, and uh, the, the next morning there was nothing here. It was just totally gutted. Um, I came over to 20 fire trucks. Thank God for fire trucks. How did it feel? Looking back at it, it the toughest shot I ever took in my life. Yeah. But I absorbed it. Because it was an amazing, I mean, amazing story that comes with it, from you know the fruits that come out of the ashes, if you know what I mean. The phoenix, the rising of the phoenix. Yeah. So. The community here clubbed together to raise enough money to put Brian back in business, and thank goodness they did, because today he's producing some incredible-looking food. This is what's amazing about this spot. I've never seen diners poach their own hams before, make their own stocks. Everything in this place is fresh. Everything. This kitchen may look small, but it sends out a huge variety of different dishes. Steamed cheeseburger. Yeah. Brian, what is a steamed cheeseburger? Well, it's a burger that uh, we cook in this box. Uh, one, two, look three, four shelves. Um, 
we put these patties in these little trays, and the trays go into the steamer. Right. And we have bigger trays with cheese that melts. We pour it over the top. They're pretty good. People people come miles for them, but I'm we not do, surprised. We do so much more. Everything in here is made from scratch, including the jam and the bread. And it seems that the amount of dishes Brian serves up knows no bounds. These are collard greens and ham hock. I did, it, I did them with pierogies, corned right. beef, and uh, cornbread. The roasted tomato soup with. Uh, risotto cake over the top as a garnish. Blueberry waffle, chocolate chips and blueberries. Parsley, sage, rosemary and thyme. This is a standard banana bread. This is our yeah. standard soda bread. That one's got uh, chocolate chips swirl through the middle of it. Um, chilies, soups, beans. Uh, there's four or five dozen brown breads and... Uh, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This place just goes on and on and on. The diner even has a garden where Brian grows his own herbs, tomatoes and berries. Oh, they're incredible, aren't incredible. they? Incredible. Finally, it's time for me to eat something. And what better than a classic diner breakfast of authentic American pancakes? Brian's batter is simply flour, salt, baking powder, bicarb soda, melted butter, buttermilk, and egg. So the buttermilk makes it slightly soury sort of taste. Yeah, correct, with the baking soda and the baking powder. Yeah. But the real secret to great pancakes is all in the cooking. Right, so what's the key to this then? Well, I want to hit them right on the right part of the grill. And that's got the most heat right where we are now. So there's no oil, nothing? Just no, no, there's, just enough, grill. there's enough oil in the griddle. Now, presuming the secret of cooking is the fact that you just want to allow it just the, the baking soda to work to Yeah, yeah. Some. you see these bubbles starting around the outside? Yeah. It's going to tell you when it wants to roll over. Brian can't resist doing things his own way, so he's added fruit, ricotta, jam and ice cream to my pancakes. So I, you just tell me when to stop, because I, I could stop, go, stop. I go all stop. down. I've there, got to drive after this. There's, yeah. no, there's no end to this stuff. It's no wonder you're busy. Yeah, it's, it's pretty good stuff. Back out in the diner, I'm treated to even more food. I've experienced the Brian special. Now I want to try the classic American pancake. So this is the classic, yeah? Yeah, no, no, pretty good. Well, it'd be rude not to. It's delicious. Classic old diner pancake. Do you know the thing about this is? You can never have enough maple syrup, though, can you? Brian has to have been the most passionate guy about food that I've certainly met on my travels around America. His enthusiasm was endless, but um, that reflected in his menu because the menu was massive. But one thing he did have on the menu that we didn't actually taste was waffles, and that's what I'm going to do now. A bacon and maple syrup waffle. Now, the recipe for pancakes or waffles is more or less the same. It contains milk, eggs and flour. Now, you could, of course, use buttermilk, but I'm going to use plain flour, three eggs and milk. So the eggs can go in, in we go with the milk and whisk this together. But the main difference between an American style pancake or a waffle and traditionally a French pancake is the addition of a rising agent and that can be baking powder or bicarb soda. I'm going to use baking powder. Next into the batter goes melted butter, sugar and salt. Now we leave that to rest just for a second. And I can get some bacon. This is streaky bacon and in America their streaky bacon is fantastic. They seem to cure it in like a maple cure which gives it a distinct flavour but most importantly a distinct texture and it crisps up really nicely. If you're not in the States, the best bacon to go for is a dry cured bacon. You don't want wet cured bacon because it contains too much water. So to help it crisp up, make sure you use the dry cured smoked bacon as well. And instead of going into the grill, I put this in a really hot oven. That's going to be served on top of the waffles, but I don't think you can ever have enough of this stuff. So I'm adding some already cooked bacon into the waffle batter as well. And then what you need to do is heat up a waffle pan. Now, traditionally, they would be done on a waffle iron, 
um, and you'd heat it up over a gas stove. It would be a huge cast iron sort of clamp. You'd put the waffle mixture in, clamp it down, and then turn it over as you go. But it's much easier on an electric waffle iron. All you need to do is add a ladle of some of the batter into each section of the waffle iron. Close the lid and cook for five minutes. In essence, people don't realise how easy it is to make waffles. They think a lot of the batter, you leave it to rest for about an hour. It's very simple. All you do is just preheat something like this and instantly you've got something for breakfast. You know, the whole mixture from weighing out the mix to finish waffles should take no more than about 10 minutes. So it's worthwhile investing in one. Crispy bacon out of the oven and a pile of freshly cooked waffles. It must be time for breakfast. For me, the only way to serve waffles is with bacon and maple syrup. And a big pile of it. And in Brian's diner, this is a small portion. Maple syrup over the top. And there you have it. An American style waffle with crispy bacon and maple syrup. Now it's dishes like this that have to be, in my mind, the ultimate comfort food. And that's why the people of Middletown in Connecticut club together to help Brian out, I reckon, because losing this is one thing that everybody would miss. It really is delicious. Today's been a day of extremes for me. On one hand, you've seen the, the modern face of publishing, and then you see Brian at the diner and the old school way of looking at food, and I love that. It just goes to prove, really, although America's great at embracing the modern technology, they never, ever want to let go of the past. <laughs>